If you would, turn your Bibles to Matthew uh, chapter number 5. Matthew 5. I see all the young people here and, and uh, to learn all of their names and, and not get them confused. And, and even uh, some say, do you know my name? I've gotten Angela wrong before. I couldn't think of it, but I've made myself make sure I never forget it again. Uh, but you got Smiley next to her, or Josephine, and of course, uh, the man, the myth, the man, the legend, Nathan, and, uh, and Mr. Friend, and Carolina, and uh, even Leah, Morgan, Caleb, Caden, he's coming and going, you never know where he is. And our newest addition to the church, Gabriel, back there, and jump over here, and you have Jeremiah, birthday boy, sweetest ever, Jonah. Samuel, and uh, then those in the nursery uh, with that. But again, uh, Matthew chapter 5, we started last week, and for the next really couple months, if you were to preach on the Sermon on the Mount, and when you think about the Sermon on the Mount, oftentimes the first thing that someone will say to you is, oh, you're talking about the Beatitudes. And although that is the introduction to the Sermon on the Mount, the Sermon on the Mount uh, encompasses three chapters. It, it encompasses chapter 5, 6, and 7 are all part of this discourse with the Lord Jesus Christ. And many times we just preach on the Beatitudes, what is known as the Beatitudes. Nine times Christ says, blessed are, blessed are, blessed are. Um, or you could use the word happy are, happy are, happy are, and uh, we miss so much in this. I believe the Lord Jesus Christ, of course, being the greatest teacher who has ever lived because he's God himself, and uh, if it was important for Jesus Christ to teach the disciples and, and, and all of those that were around him at the time, I believe it's important for us to go over it as well. We started looking at this last week on, uh, on the first two verses we preached on last week and set the context for it. Remember, Jesus is just beginning his earthly ministry. He's just begun, and he sits his disciples down, and he teaches them this. He didn't stand. He didn't walk around. He sat in reverence to the teaching that he was about to, uh, that he was about to give for. So as we study this Sermon on the Mount, we're going to look at the next couple of weeks the most familiar part of the Sermon on the Mount. Now this, core, this, this, this discourse, this passage comes uh, from the uh, Latin word beatitudes, literally means happiness or bliss. It means happy. And uh, blessed are, happy are. We're going to look at that here in the next few moments. You know, when you look at this passage of Scripture, as we looked at last week, remember that the end of the Old Testament in Malachi uh, verse chapter 4, 6, it, it, was, it ended with judgment. There were 400 silent years, and when you jump into the New Testament, you have grace, peace, joy in the beginning of the New Testament in the Gospels. So the heart of the passage of this focuses on the joy that believers can experience. When you look at the Beatitudes and, and you just take a quick look, blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are those that mourn, blessed are the meek, blessed are they which do hunger and thirst. That's not happy statements, let's be honest. When someone is hungry, or have you ever heard the term hangry? A little bit of anger and a lot of hunger and they're like, I am starving to death. Now, I use that statement once in a while. My wife's like, I don't think so. You could last another couple months, honey, and not eat. Just a little bit of water, you're good to go on that. But when you look at that, but when you look at the Beatitudes, it is the joy of the Christian life. Joy that we can experience. Now, Jesus uses the word blessed nine times in these opening verses. Now, clearly, there is a significant emphasis on being blessed. This has the idea of spiritual joy, 
satisfaction that lasts regardless of the conditions that you find yourselves in, that carries one through pain, sorrow, loss, and grief. You know, happiness is not dictated in the Christian life by the happenings of life. It's what Jesus Christ has already done for us in the finished work of the cross. Yes, there's going to be sorrow. Yes, there's going to be tears. Friday night, uh, we drove to the other side of the state for a viewing for a godly lady that we knew and her family. And there was a lot of tears, but there was a lot of laughter as well. Why? Although there's the loss of a loved one, there's the joy of salvation. Knowing where this person is. And so, uh, on the surface here, much of what Jesus says... Uh, appears to be a contradiction to happy. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the mourn. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sakes. Oh, that's a good one. I love persecution, don't you? But what is Jesus Christ teaching here? What is he trying to get us to understand here? You know, to the world, these would appear... As contradictions. But we must remember that God's thoughts, God's ways are much different than ours. God's uh, talks about it in Isaiah 55. My ways are, are higher than your ways. My thoughts are higher than your thoughts. His economy is different than ours. But also understand that the Sermon on the Mount is written to those who know Christ. Those who have a relationship with Christ. It's not to the world. It's to the Christian. It's to those who know Him. So this blessings are not promised to those who have no personal relationship with the Lord, but to those who know Him. I want us to look at... A few of these here this morning, as you look at Matthew chapter 5, and we'll read uh, one through, really right down through, it says, And seeing uh, the multitude, he went up into a mountain, and when he was set, his disciples came unto him, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed Excuse me, blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. Uh, for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. I want us to look at several of these beatitudes this morning. First of all, looking at verse number three, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. This is blessed or happy are the simple. Happy are the simple. Now, I know it's the first thing that came to your mind. You said, are you calling me a simple-minded person? Are you calling me uneducated? That's not what I'm saying here. Now, on the surface, this statement from the Lord seems to be a contradiction from what we've been taught or experienced in life. Uh, how many of you would agree with me? The poor, the people who are poor, often find themselves dealing with the harsh effects of poverty, hunger, improper clothing, housing. A person who is poor can find themselves in uh, a, 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 a manner that uh, is not that we would look at as being uh, a healthy place. I was reading this morning and and looked at a video of Oakland, California, and how the a homeless crisis that's going across our whole nation, but you look at uh, California, you look at Arizona, you look at Texas and Florida, and, 
and just the homeless, uh, really, encampments that they have built and, and how unsanitary it is. I would say those people are poor people. But that's not what Christ is talking about here. See, we must understand that Christ in the Beatitudes is not talking about the physical. He's talking about the spiritual. He's talking about our relationship with Him, our relationship with mankind. So those who read it from a a physical standpoint say, oh, blessed are the poor. That means that I can't have money. That means I can't have things. That means I can't have a nice house or a nice car or, or good food. It means that I have to live in poverty. And Christ is saying, no, if that were true, Christ would not have multiplied the loaves of bread in feeding of the 5,000. If if he wanted people to be poor, and he says, listen, I think you ought to be poor and and, and physically poor, he would say, then then you ought to starve or you ought to go and, and, and scavenge for food. But that's not what Christ is talking about here. While it is true that those who are poor in material wealth are often closer to the Lord, dependent upon God, This is not what it's talking about here. See, he is speaking of those who are poor in spirit. Those who have come to the realization that they needed something in their life that the world could never give to them. What God can give us is completely different than what the world can give us. Yes, God can provide wealth. God can provide food. God can provide housing. God can provide all of those things. But the one thing the world can't provide is a spiritual relationship with God. You see, these have realized that Jesus alone can supply what one truly needs in life. What does one need in life? What we have in material possessions really is not the issue. You know, it is often difficult for those who have uh, everything and need for nothing for them to see a need for Christ. Why do I need God? I have everything that I need. Great job, a lot of money, nice car, beautiful home, lots of food, uh, friends. Why do I need God? Well, it's not just about the material. It's also about the eternal You know, without the good hand of God working in our lives, we have nothing really to rejoice or boast in. You know, you it it makes it real when you go to a funeral service or you go to a visitation. That person came in with nothing, that person left with nothing physically. But yet the Bible says that to lay up treasures in heaven, not in earth. If a person dies, that's the end of their life. Nothing that they can do. Think about Nicodemus. Nicodemus was a rich man. Nicodemus was wealthy by the standards of this world, but he came to the place in in his life where he realized that he lacked something that only Christ could give. Remember, he came to him at night. And he says, hey, I I need something from you. And he went into his house and he told him about Christ. Told him about himself. He realized that he needed more than what he had gained in this life. See, those who are poor in spirit are truly blessed. Why? They no longer are depending upon themselves or the, uh, their financial gain, but in the finished work of the cross. I'm poor in spirit. I realize there's absolutely nothing I can do about my sin condition. Only God can take care of it. So when Jesus is teaching this, blessed are the poor in spirit, uh, uh, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Listen, my treasure's in heaven. What I, I have on this earth, yes, material possessions, and, and I enjoy the things of the world, not, not the things that the, the, the world as far as a, anything that is anti-God. I love hunting, love fishing, I love fellowship, I love getting together, playing games. I, I enjoy all of those things. 
but what God did in my life is eternal. So when he talks about blessed are the pearls, you see in Psalm 30, 37, 16, a little that a righteous man hath is better than the riches of many wicked. I was reading this from G, uh, G. Campbell Morgan last night and this morning that uh, when you look at the Beatitudes, it's not something that you are doing. It is something that you are. It's being in a relationship with Christ. Blessed are those who have a humble spirit before the Lord. You look at verse 4. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the sorrowful, or happy are the sorrowful. Now, there seems to be a little blessing in mourning and sorrow. How many agree that uh, pain or sorrow or mourning is, is not a happy time in a person's life? But yet the Bible says, Jesus declares that those who are sorrowful and broken, those mourning over sin, shall be brought to laughter and joy. You know, clearly we need godly sorrow in our lives. I rejoice the day that I realized my sin and accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as my Savior. You know, you take uh, any child but our, our grandbaby and she... Uh, starts to spit up and it's not a little bit it's a lot and you grab the rag real quick and you wipe her face off and and then you turn it to a dry spot if she does it again and and then you sit it out to dry you fold it up you put it back in there and you reuse it tomorrow right no no my daughter would kill me keep all that's used over here if she wets through you put it over here you wash it, and you what? Use it again. You see, when we get real about our sin, and, and we realize that we're in sin, we realize that we are a sinner, we ask God to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We receive the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior. Even if we are saved, we get ourselves right with God. That, that joy comes back in. Remember what David said? He said, restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. Man, my sin is causing me to, to not uh, enjoy life. My sins have caused my bones to vex. Or God, would you please bring that joy back into my life? You see, when he says, blessed are they that mourn, we mourn over the sins in our life. It was through sorrow and shame of our sinful condition that we saw the need for salvation. Think about this. If a person has never been broken over sin, they would never have been able to rejoice in salvation. You see, salvation isn't, a, isn't just words. Well, you Baptists, you Baptists use this, you know, uh, just ask Jesus Christ to come into your heart and you're saved. That's not biblical and I don't teach that. We agree with God that we are a sinner in need of a Savior we agree with God that we are a sinner. We agree with God that He is, Jesus Christ is the only Son of God that provides the way of salvation. We agree with God that it's through the blood of Christ that we are saved. And then we say, Lord Jesus Christ, would you come into my heart and save me? At that moment when you receive Christ as your Savior, the Holy Spirit indwells you. The joy. But if a person says, well, I don't think I need Christ, I don't agree with all of that, but hey, let me just say some words, that person is not saved. Blessed are those who have been brought to a place of sorrow for their sins. How many of you, even though you're saved and you try to do right, you're broken over sin once in a while? You've done something or said something, and I'm not talking about immoral activity. And that's almost like the Holy Spirit just stabs you. You're broken over that sin. What does the Bible say? The Bible says in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sin, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It means He washes us and makes us usable again. But you know, when the Holy Spirit convicts us, we need to run to the Lord. 
Folks, there are days that I stumble and fall. There are days that I come short to what Christ desires of me. But it's in those times that we feel this godly uh, sorrow for our failures. But thank God for those times of sorrows because it reminds me of all that Jesus Christ did for me. It reminds me of my great need for Him. It reminds me that the only thing I have to go to Him and say, Lord, forgive me of sins. That doesn't mean that I've lost my salvation. It just means that my, my uh, uh, heart and, and fellowship is in separation with God. And we make ourselves right before Him. Folks, you know we also need an attitude of sorrow for those that are around us. Those that need Christ. As I've said, we're living in days that we have never as a country seen before. We're living in a time of, of, of uh, uh, something we never could have guessed. Our, our country's in moral decay. This is not a, a, a Republican, Democrat. Our country's been in decay for a long time. You remove God, and that's exactly what's going to happen. The biggest problem is the church has been silent. Church doesn't preach the Word of God. The, the church preaches a feel-good message. What do you want? That's what I'll give you. No, it's not what you want. It's what you need. Little Jason, I get myself in trouble often. I know it's hard for you to believe that. I know. During these potlucks, he won't eat food, but he will eat Preserved. It's your, don't blame me, blame him. It's his fault. And Joe, he always goes to the dessert first. Eat your chicken, eat your food. No. Then he comes over by me, you want a cookie? Yes. I'll take a cookie and then I look over at mom and she's glaring. I'm like, okay, we're doing wrong, but maybe half. But you got to eat your food. You know, we, uh, I was going someplace with that. But so often we give people what they want. Christ went into the synagogues. Christ went where the Pharisees were. Christ went to where the heathens were. He didn't change the message. He gave them the truth. He told them exactly what they needed. Folks, we need to come to the place where our heart is burdened for the lost around us. Listen, when people are hurting and people are going through tragedy, the first thing they usually do is they try to find someone who's saved or they call the church and say, is there any way you can help me or could you give me some words of advice? A child dies. I'll receive a phone call and I say, can I ask a question, Pastor? We don't go to church, but our baby passed away. And they weren't baptized. Does that mean our baby will go to hell? And I'll take God's word and show them, first of all, how they can know Jesus Christ, their personal Savior. I take them to the story of David and his son. I say, no, your child's not in hell. They haven't come to the place of understanding. And I try to show them in God's word. But they're hurting. I say, can I meet with you? Can I talk with you? Someone will be, an elderly person will call and say, Pastor, would you pray for us? Uh, we're going through a hard time. You see, hurting people need the truth. I ought to be all right. Don't worry about a thing. No, here's what God can do for you. This is what God can do. For you. Folks, let us never forget the needs of others. Let us always remember. We need to be sorrowful and seek the Lord uh, to touch their hearts and lives. You know, new hope needs sorrow for those who need the Lord. Jeremiah 9.1, Oh, that my head were waters and mine eyes fountains of tears, that I might weep day and night for the slain of the daughters of my people. In Psalm 126, verses 5 and 6, They that sow in tears shall reap in joy, for he that goeth forth and weepeth beareth precious seed. Yea, it shall doubtless come again rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. Not only the simple and the sorrowful, but the submissive. 
In verse number 5, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Now, here the word meek is interesting. It speaks of mildness and disposition, a gentleness of spirit, often used to describe a soothing medicine or a gentle breeze a term used to speak of a colt or oxen that has been broken and was useful for work. It deals with a strong and yet teachable spirit. Now here we need to take this, take it and consider the context of this passage. Jesus is talking to the Jews here. He was born among the Jews. He was a Jew. uh, The Jews are God's chosen people. So for centuries, these proud Jews uh, laid claim to their heritage through Moses, through Abraham, I should say. I'm the descendant of Abraham. I'm a Jew. I'm God's holy people. I'm God's chosen people. They were zealous in keeping the law of Moses. So in their minds, they were a righteous people. In fact, they were as righteous as they could get. Anybody other than the Pharisees and and the Sadducees, boy, you you were the the bottom feeders. Oh, Jesus Christ is teaching to them. Jesus rebukes their pride and reveals their great need for meekness. He reveals that God desires those who are humble before Him. Now this goes hand in hand with the need for being poor in spirit. You see, our poverty of spirit recognizes our sinfulness. But our meekness of spirit recognizes God's holiness. When we see our sin as we do, and we receive Christ as our Savior... And we start living for God, we see God for who He is. God is holy. God is righteous. Happy are the meek. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. It is that attitude of meekness that humbles us before God. You see, one cannot see either without meekness or humility. A proud heart would never recognize its sin or need of salvation nor would it recognize the holiness of God and the need to submit to God. Would you not agree that America is a lot like Israel of that day? We are a proud, arrogant people. We don't need God. We don't need um, anything that any moral person... We certainly don't need Christians. As you heard this week, the the, the thing that's destroying America is mega Republicans. No, the thing that's destroying America is sin. Simple as that. Because there's a lot of Republicans that are as wicked as the day is long, right along with their counterparts. We need God in this country. We don't need to, uh, well, well, you know, I know what you're saying about me, but if you looked at him, ain't that what, isn't that what Peter said? Peter said, now what, what, what about him? What about John? And he says, what is that to thee? In the end of the book of John, he says, hey, don't look at John, look at your own life. Folks, we need to take a good look in the mirror and not look at everybody else and say, am I the problem? How do I fix the problem? How do I make things right? You know, looking at America here, we've been blessed beyond measure. We are a blessed nation. And then I see these these, uh, millennials and college students and college age saying we deserve more. We need to be a socialist nation. You have no clue what you're talking about. You know, we are so messed. There's so many ways. There are so many things I'd love to say, but it just burns me up. You'll let a six-year-old choose his gender, but you won't let an 18-year-old buy cigarettes. Now, I'm against cigarettes. I'm against a six-year-old choosing their gender as well. 
this wonderful bill that was given has gender replacement in it. You get to pay for someone to change who they are. Listen, if someone says, aren't you embarrassed for who you are? No, I was fearfully and wonderfully made in the image of God. God made me exactly like He wanted me. I will never, it will be, and I know this might not be the right phrase, it'll be an ice cold day in hell before I ever apologize for who I am. Folks, we need to humble ourselves. We need to realize that as a nation, God has blessed us, but that blessing can be taken away from us as well as it is. But folks, I just believe the rapture is sooner than it's ever been. The time has never been shorter, but the need has never been greater to tell people about Christ. It is not a Baptist message, it's a Bible message. God's Word declares it. God said it, that settles it, whether I believe it or not. Folks, we need to come to the place. And this is what he's saying. Blessed or happy are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. We are much like the Jews of old, quick to point out the righteousness and, and, and contrast with, with the sinfulness of those around us. Are we willing to humble ourselves as others have before us? Would we be willing to endure the difficulties that others face for the glory of God? Would we be willing to continue to fellowship and follow the Lord even though we had no idea where he was leading us? That's what he did to Abraham, Joseph, Moses, David. I'm going to lead you to a place that you know nothing about and they willingly followed. Would we be willing to do that? Persecution. This question has been asked to me multiple times. Pastor, what are we going to do if I, I know we live stream, and there's folks watching right now uh, live stream, and they'll text me and say, hey, I appreciate the message. And, and if I mention anything about uh, a certain uh, red and, and silver colored football team, uh, I'll get a lot of responses. And I thought they were going down last night. And not that I was praying for that, Barb. I know you're listening here, and Angie and Pam and, and Joe, but uh, they did prevail. Um, against the fighting uh, or the, the, the uh, uh, Notre Dame and, and against that. And, uh, but, you know, we can uh, uh, see now, it's, see, that team just took my mind, right? The spirit has left. We need to come back to the Lord. I really was going someplace. I mean, I get lost in translation often. I need to quit going down these rabbit trails. It'll come back to me at the end. You know, but we're quick to address the others, and we need in our lives a humble, teachable spirit before the Lord. You know, when you look at the meekness shall inherit the earth, we need to be willing to follow what God has for us. You know, this is a, a profound statement, two ways. Think about this. In this passage, in that verse, there is a present application those who are meek, humble, and teachable of the Lord would enjoy their present situation. How many of you are enjoying life right now? God's been good. Going through some difficult times? Oh, yeah. Have some pain and trials? Oh, yeah. You stay up most of the night in prayer? Oh, yeah. But I wouldn't change it for anything. God's so good to us. I mean, I, I look at all of the folks here and the blessings and the friends that I have and family. I look at the back and our beautiful granddaughter and think, man, God's been good. I'm going to enjoy life. I, I decided a long time ago that I'm not going to let somebody dictate my joy. Oh, there's some trials, there's some hard things, there's some unknowns that are in the future. But God knows what they are. You see, 
this is not to say that we will never face difficulties as many of us are. But our lives are lived in light of Jesus Christ and our relationship with Him. That is a comfort for us. Do I fear death? No. Do I want to go today? No. But I know where my eternal home is. Why? Because I settled it. I received the Lord Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. And I can never lose my salvation because I don't hold on to my salvation. God does. That eternal being. But there's also a future application. Clearly, Jesus is also making reference to the new heaven and the new earth that will be revealed after the tribulation. Listen, our blessed Savior will return to this earth and uh, He will rapture the church in the rapture, seven years of tribulation. He will come back and establish the millennial kingdom for a thousand years. You know what's exciting during that? We'll rule and reign with Christ. We will be with Christ during that time. During that time, the redeemed will be with Him. At the conclusion of the millennial reign, God is going to judge the great white throne judgment. And then we will enjoy the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ, God himself for all eternity. We will inherit all that God provides for us. And you also see blessed are the seekers in verse 6. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst After righteousness, for they shall be filled. Once again, Jesus uh, makes a statement that is sometimes it's hard to understand from a physical standpoint. Again, would God possibly be talking about uh, being hungry is good? It's good for people to be hungry. As I just mentioned a minute ago, of course the Lord would never uh, teach that. Uh, the breaking of the bread, the multiplication of the bread. Yeah, there's a tremendous illustration in that, in the, in the loaves of bread and the fishes. God just took up 12 baskets of bread, no fishes. The fish always represent the Christian. The Christians are raptured. 12 tribes of Israel are left. That's another message. But you look at how he multiplied. Jesus doesn't desire people to suffer. You know, we have never been hungry like some people are. You know, I'm not a prepper. I am a preparer. You ought to prepare yourselves. You know, they say that the average person has three days food in their refrigerator. Three days. They say that you should have six months to a year's worth of food. Now, don't go out and buy a bunch of gallons of milk that's going to go bad. It's going to be rancid. But you ought to have food. I believe that we are going to see uh, epic starvation around the world. You say, never in America. Uh, Listen, there's a lot of things that's happened in America we never thought would happen. I believe you ought to prepare. I believe you ought to have food. With the lack of food, what happens? How many had breakfast this morning? How many had something for breakfast? If you didn't, it's your fault because we had wonderful, um, it was a pumpkin type cake bread. It was delicious. But I promise you, my stomach is starting to make noise. And you're like, yeah, hurry up, be quiet. You know, I've heard what a, a sermon ought to be. It, 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 you ought to be able to uh, stand up and preach the word. And then when you're done, you ought to be able to sit down. And between those two points, it ought to be really short. Now, I know what you're saying. My stomach is growling right now. How many are you planning on eating lunch? Well, they're here at home. And if you don't, by, by supper, you're going to be starving to death. I mean, you, you might not even make it through the night without food. You, you might die without, without nutrition. How many of you get hangry? How many get irritated when you're not? That's why you have candy bars in the home. So when your wife starts to get a little bit irritated, just throw chocolate at her. I mean, try to land it at her feet. Don't aim with a big bar trying to hit her. 
you know, hey, look over there and hit her inside. Not saying that. But, honey, a peace offering. Put it on a stick or something for her. But, but all, after we've eaten part of it, yes. We, we had a candy bar at home. and I said, where did that candy bar go? I don't know. <laughs> something ate it. If you ask my wife, she loves s'mores. Minus the marshmallow and the cracker. <laughs> I love s'mores. Just minus those things. Just give me the chocolate. Listen, food is good for us. Nutrition. Now, had he desired this, he wouldn't have multiplied. The truth that Jesus is teaching is to hunger and thirst after those things which the Lord gives us. Those things which God has. Those things which only God can give to us. He reveals that those who seem to never get enough of His Word, His presence, and His fellowship are truly blessed or happy. You know, those who seek the direction and help of the Lord each day and in every circumstance are blessings from the Lord. What is that you desire to hunger for in life? Are you hungry for the things of God or hungry for the things of the world? The older I get, the more I realize how much I missed out by not going all out for God. So many things in life we miss. God is the only one that can give us peace. God is the only one that can give us comfort. Do we seek after those things of the Lord? You know, there is... A hunger for the flesh to satisfy its desires. You know, we still live in a body of flesh and we must continually battle it. Why? The flesh desires the things of the flesh. And we as humans will satisfy the needs that we desire. If you desire a soda, I mean, I just... Oh, I desperately want a Coke right now or a Mountain Dew or that, that, that Verner's, Black Cherry Verner's. I just so desire that right now. If you have a deep desire for it, what are you going to do? You're probably going to go get it. I desire this meal. You're going to make that meal. I desire to buy this. And, 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 and you keep going after it, you're going to pick it up. But how about desiring the things for God? God, what do you have for me today? Well, let me grab your Bible and open it up and, and start reading. And Lord, speak to me today. Give me something today. Hey, Lord, reveal some great truth to me that I need. Help me through the day. See, whatever we desire, we're going to satisfy. And he's saying, listen, blessed are those which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled those who are truly blessed have made a commitment to feed the spiritual man. The Bible says in Psalm 42, 1, As the heart panteth after the water brooks, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. See, if you want to enjoy the blessings of God and His goodness in your life, hunger after the Lord. Listen, never get to the place where you are satisfied. Always desire more. You know, you go down here and in the fellowship hall and you look at all the food and desserts that are down there and, and you're, uh, you know, how many of your eyes are bigger than your plate? And you put all this food on there and you're like, I don't know if I can eat it all. And then you say, I am stuffed. And someone says, did you try that raspberry pie? Did you try this? Suddenly you're hungry again. And you go pick that up. And how many of you had parents that would say, now listen, stand up and do jumping jacks. Do 25 jumping jacks. Like it's going to pack it down in there. Okay, now you have more room. Those things that we desire in life, we will fulfill. Do we hunger after the things of God? We could all feed more on the Word of God. Listen, there's not one person here who doesn't need to draw closer to the Lord Jesus Christ. Not one person in here that could not draw closer to God. You know, I feel that many Christians in our day are suffering from spiritual starvation. Let me ask you a, a, a question. Uh, 
How many of you could eat the meal this afternoon? You stuff yourself with the meal, and you're good until next Sunday. One meal for the whole week. How many would be satisfied? Nobody. How many would be hungry in 30 minutes? You're putting the last bite in. What's for supper? You know, you take a baby. They're 100% dependent upon you. I look at Adeline. She eats every two to three hours, and she lets you know when she's hungry. Well, girl, you just got done eating. You don't need to eat for a couple more days. No. She has a desire because inside her little belly is starting to hurt, and she has a desire for food. You give her food, and that satisfies her for a couple hours. And that takes place all day and all night. We need to feed on the Word of God. We ought to come to the place where our conscience, our spirit, I shouldn't say conscience, our spirit is, prob- is, is probing us and, and pricking us saying, listen, you need something from the Word of God. Don't go to bed without reading a little bit. Don't go to bed without studying it. Don't get, uh, leave work in the morning until you've had it. Listen to it on the way to work. But make sure you're feeding upon my word all day. You know, the only spiritual nourishment that some get is just on Sunday. You know, the spiritual man needs to eat more than the physical man. We need to develop a hunger for the Lord and be happy. You know, you eat and you push yourself away from the table or your belly pushes you away from the table. And you say, man, I am full. I ate too much, but I'm glad I did. And you're happy. And then you get hungry again. How many of us have feasted on the word of God and we sat back and said, man, I'm full. What you gave me, God, is unbelievable. And then a few hours later, you're thinking about what you've read and you're pondering, you're meditating upon the Word. That's what he's saying here. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are they that mourn. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. If you seek God, He'll give you what you need. You have not because you ask not. That's the word of God. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you again for this wonderful day that you've given us. And Lord, your word. And I know I spoke to Christians this, this morning, but Lord, maybe someone here this morning does not know you as their personal Savior. And maybe there's never been a time or a moment in their life when they have said, Lord, come into my heart and save me. Take me to heaven when I die. And the Holy Spirit has indwelled you at that moment in time. Maybe someone here said, I think I say I'm saved, I believe I'm saved, but I'm not sure. I would never talk someone into salvation, Lord, but I would never talk them out of getting the assurance of their salvation either. Maybe there's someone like that this morning to say, Pastor, would you pray for me? I won't embarrass you, I won't call you down. Or maybe you'd say, Pastor, would you pray for me. I don't know for sure that if I died today that I'd go to heaven, but I'd like to know. I'd like to know this thing of salvation or this relationship with Christ. I'm not religious at all. I do have a great relationship with Christ. He saved my soul. Is there one like that today? Say, Pastor, would you pray for me? I don't know for sure. Maybe someone here today would say, Pastor, pray for me. I won't have you raise your hand, but in your heart, God sees it. I just need to feast more upon the things of God. I need to spend more time with the Lord, less time with the world. Dear Holy Father, be with us during this moment in time. We love you. We pray in your precious and holy name. Amen.